What up team, lovely to have you aboard. Today we're going to finish our web performance mini-series by talking about loading. <laughs> it's because the episode's about loading. It's... Once again, I'm hilarious. Carry on. Okay, so we've talked about responses and animations and idle. And so we've hit this final point in the rail model. And the idea, if you remember, was that we could split our application up into these different phases, loading and responses and animations. They all kind of happen. And they're these kind of discrete phases in your application. So loading is, well, it's pretty much the first thing that happens because you go from about blank, so an empty whatever, or a previous tab, whatever it is, to your thing. So the fun thing about working with the web is that it is a streaming platform which makes it different to many other platforms. By streaming I mean that we're going to send you bytes for your application bit by bit by bit and ideally speaking we don't want to wait until the end before we show something. So is there a magic number for load? Yes there is. It's 1000 milliseconds and that's a very difficult thing to meet, especially if you've got uh, HTTPS, which I think most people probably do. Uh, maybe you're on 3G or 2G, it becomes very, very difficult, but we can still optimize towards that goal. And uh, things like service workers do allow us to bring those numbers right down because we can put stuff into the cache and to disk so that next time we are really fast. That first boot, that initial load, what we really wanna be optimizing for is the minimum, like what's the minimum we can ship so that you can get up and running. The key here is to not block the user's experience until we have everything, but rather what we want to do is we want to start to send things in, in bits and pieces down the wire and as they become available, boot them up, you know? And if you remember from the last video on idle, we actually have a tactic for this using something like intersection observers. So the thing to do is to think in terms of these discrete units, let's call them. I've got a carousel, I've got video player, I've got lazy loading images, all that good stuff. But they don't all need to load at once and you'll have different requirements on what needs to load and when and so on, blah, 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 blah. So what we need to do is we need to come up with a mechanism that actually breaks our components into two parts. There's the kind of booting, getting ready, and then there's the, aha, now is my time to shine moment. So what I've got on screen is an example of a component, a lazy load uh, image component, which is going to wait until uh, the element is on screen before it actually loads and crossfades the image in. And so to show this, I have a few images in the page and I've also switched off caching just so that we are forced to load the image every time. And over here, I've throttled down to fast 3G just because these images are gonna come from my disk and Otherwise, you wouldn't see what I'm talking about. So what we do, I will show you what it actually does first. Uh, if I just refresh the page, you'll see we get these sort of loaders and then boop, as the images are available, they cross fade in. Now there are two images further down the page. Watch happens when I scroll. There's image three and image four being requested. So if you didn't notice them, they were requested here, image three and image four. I'll do it again. In fact, let me just show you, uh, if I refresh the page when I'm part scrolled, like down at the bottom here, we're going to get images three and four because those are the ones that are on screen right now. Those are the components that are ready to roll. The other two, images one and two, if I scroll up slowly, here comes boop, image two and image one. So imagine, for example, one of these was your comments component. Doesn't need to be booted when the page boots. We can wait until it's on screen or even a user clicks a button and then we can go and boot the element. So how do we go about doing something like this? Well, for that, let's turn to our code. So I have uh, the code here for the lazy image first of all. And what the lazy image is, is a custom element. Again, not gonna get into custom elements. There is plenty of guidance out there and I would recommend that you go and read that. I'll try and link something uh, below. If you've not come across custom elements, they are really useful, uh, but it can be done without. So take that as you like, really. Some days I feel like using them, some days, actually no, most days I do feel like using them because I think they're really good. Anyway, <laughs> so we've got uh, our lazy image here, which extends HTML element. And there are some attributes that we care about watching, the source, the width, and the height. 
because it's essentially standing in place of an image element. So I'm just reflecting the image elements attributes that I care about to the custom element. Boom. Now, the constructor itself sets up a few variables. Uh, the fact that the image is loaded, what the current source is, and then it creates the, the kind of actual image element under the hood. And it just says, when that image is loaded, I would like you to set the loaded flag to true, um, remove any children of the uh, existing um, element, and then append the image. So we're just sort of waiting. As soon as the image loads, great, off we go. So that's, that happens in the constructor. So as soon as we make a lazy image, like this gets set up, but you'll notice that we don't set the source of the image particularly at this point, because that would trigger the image being fetched and uh, put into the page and everything else. Don't want to do that right now. All we're doing is kind of doing this sort of setup work and then kind of deferring the actual booting until some other point in the future. So the other thing that's part of this is the attributes changing. So for example, when the source changes or the width changes or the height changes, and I just use those to, again, store values. I don't really do anything particularly with them. Although in the case of width and height, there is something that I do, which is I reserve the space. One of the caveats of doing something like a progressive booting is that you want to avoid the situation where the page kind of moves around that's the international sign for moving around. I don't know what I'm doing, but we're doing it anyway. Imagine the situation where we've got these images in place, but they haven't loaded yet. But well, we want to, where we can, reserve space for them. So for example, if you've got a lazy loading carousel, ideally you want to reserve the space for that carousel so that when it loads in, it doesn't pop, make the page move around. Nobody enjoys that. There are loads of ways to do it, Grid is one of them, reserving space, in this case by sort of JavaScripty type means where we just use the styles and just, whoop, that's my size. There are loads of ways to do it, but what I would encourage you to do is think about, okay, as part of my sort of setup for this element, I need to reserve space for it because I know its contents aren't there, but I want to reserve the space for it so that when its contents arrive, off we go. Now, you might say, well, I don't know the size of this element, It it's, not clear to me how big this element is going to be. Well, there are no easy answers there. If you don't know how big an element's going to be, it's pretty challenging. But I would say for those that you do know, definitely try and get those in to try and minimize this. Um, also, really, you want to be thinking about why is it I don't know the size of this element? Is it, I mean, it could be any size. And that, that should be a concern from a UX point of view that you don't know the size of an element. It's something to think through. There aren't any easy answers, but I think it's a case of trying to get to the state where you say there are fewer unknowns about this page. Okay, so when we set the source, so for example here, the source, we just track it. We just say, well, the source is what it is, and you've changed the source, so we definitely haven't loaded it. That's what we're going with for now. And then if you set the width and height, we reserve the space on both the image element itself and the parent, the containing element, our lazy uh, image element itself. Okay. So now we've kind of set up the element, but we actually haven't done anything with it. Here is the, the function that we care about uh, for actually kind of, okay, do something now. Uh, and that's this visible uh, property that we've got, which is just a setter. And if there's no source or the image is not visible or it's already loaded, just bail, we're, we're done. Other than that, if those criteria are not met, uh, we would just want to set the image source to be whatever the current source is set to. So this should mean that what will happen is eventually when somebody sets visible to true, the image will now get loaded and then the whole sort of journey will begin because when the image is finished loading, we'll set the flag, we'll remove the children and we'll append it to our DOM. So far, so good. Now we have the other bit, which is the machinery that's actually going to set visible to true. And if you remember from the idle video, we can use intersection observers as a signal for Okay, this is on the screen, that's fine. Now let's actually load the content. Well, we could use other things like the user clicked a button or we've had some idle time with request idle callback or, you know, pick your thing really. Um, but the point is we have some kind of signal. In this case, I'm using an intersection observer as my mechanism. And so what we've got here is we've got the lazy image class that we're importing and we say to the custom elements global uh, I'd like to define lazy dash image as being my lazy images and then I'm going through and asking for all the lazy images that are in the page and of course you could find it uh, in other ways or you could manually uh, add things to this list if you are dynamically adding them to the page for example so there's loads of ways you could do this 
And then I create an intersection observer and I say, I want you to set the visible of our images. So each of the images, I want you to um, set it's visible to true or false, depending on whether it's actually intersecting with the viewport. So as an image comes into the viewport, we're going to set visible to true, which is going to trigger the load of the image. And then the last thing that we do is we tell the intersection observer to observe all images. And this could be tracking not just images, but all components. So again, carousels, video players, comments, fields, you name it. We can take the same approach here of using an intersection observer to say, aha, it's on screen or aha, the user has clicked the special button, whatever it is. So we can use a number of signals. And the idea here is that in some way we are now going to trigger this work and say, well, get the image. In our case, that is going off and getting the image source and that will load the image and put it in and do all that work that we talked about previously. So without this line here, the uh, observing line, we will end up in a situation where we would spin forever. So we've never received that signal that says, aha, this is now important. And in fact, what I'm going to do, I'm just going to grab one of these myself, just a lazy image. I'm going to do $0 over here and I'm going to say visible equals true, true. And that will actually trigger the work, you see? like that. And I'll grab this one as well. I'm just going to, in fact, let me just grab the other one that's on screen and I'm going to do the same thing there. So we could actually do this manually. We could do this in other ways. So let me just do that quickly. Um, let me see. Yes. What I'm going to do is I'm going to say image on click and I'm doing this in a very quick, um, at least it needs to go inside the for loop, Paul. Yes, it does. Um, I'm going to just say uh, image dot La la la, visible equals true. So there are other ways, as I say, there are other ways to do this. So we've got our lazy images. I'm gonna click on this one and hopefully, there you go, it loads. Boop. So yeah, we can make it so it clicks. In our case, what I'm doing is I'm using the, uh, the observe as a thing, but we could do click. We could also grab this over here and just say, hey, you know what? If you've got some idle time, then also go ahead. So we'll just say, if on screen or clicked, <laughs> I can't spell apparently, uh, or there is idle time. So the broad idea is that you've got these two passes. The first is the setup of the component and the second is, okay, now do the work. And we wanna do that when there's some notion of user-driven kind of importance, whether that's it, they've scrolled and it's on screen or it's, you know, they've clicked it or it's that there's some idle time. So we could just go off and, you know, do the work. And so back here on screen, this results in the case where we're going to get all four immediately requested because the idle time is the first thing that kicked in. And that's as it is. Now we're requesting all of those at the same time here because we've got one, two, three, four, or in this case, two, three, four, one, because there's just been some idle time. They've been requested. It's all good. What you might want to do is you might want to set up a queue so that there's some kind of definitive order so that you're saying, no, 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 always get the masthead first, then get the comments, then get this, then get that. You can see hopefully how you can just build on this idea. Key thing, don't boot everything at once, spread your booting out and try and prioritize so the important things come first. So there's loads more to say about all this kind of stuff and far more than I can fit into this video, but I wanted to share just a little bit about how you can think about particularly the progressive booting story. There's content I'm gonna link below, which is Udacity courses and documentation and anything that I can think of between now and getting this video live. Uh, so go off and have a read of that kind of stuff. I hope you've enjoyed this video. Subscribe if you haven't already. Give it a thumbs up. Ring the notification bell if that's something you're into. And I will catch you lovely folk on the flip side. The key here is to not block. Uh, but the key here is until... Whatever, let's keep going. And they need to be... Everything until some... Like, it's unique to the web. Uh, no, I don't want to say that either. We send you bytes. Still don't know what I'm doing. Still, still figuring it out. All right. I've got a reflector now. So hopefully the lighting is slightly better. There's the light up there. 
reflector there, microphone there, bass there. Everybody who asks, are you going to play the bass? No, no. Nobody wants just a solo bass. Nobody wants to see me going. Dung, 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 No. Why would you? Why would you? Why would you want that? I don't want that. You don't want that. Nobody wants that. 